Thank you. So um, I'm Adam Pocock. I'm a researcher in the Machine Learning Research Group in Oracle Labs. Um, and today I'm going to talk about Onyx and the Java platform. So one question, everyone's talking about Python today. Why would we want to support Onyx on the JVM or on the Java platform? Well, ML models are increasingly important in basically every application. And most applications, especially like large business applications of the kind we're interested in Oracle, are written in languages that are not Python. So we could either get all those developers to move to Python, which doesn't seem very likely, or we could bring machine learning to them in the languages they work in, like Java or C Sharp or JavaScript. Um, Java is one of the largest platforms for building these for building live software applications in the world. There's millions of Java developers, and we think it'd be good for the ML for the Onyx, Onyx community and sort of the wider ML community to try and help them integrate ML into their applications by meeting them where they are in the JVM. Uh, so I've spent the past few years sort of building Java ML tooling, both for Onyx and other ML libraries, and we'll talk a little bit about some of that today. Um, so the first thing was uh, the Onyx Runtime Java API. So this was something that was built in our group um, in Oracle Labs in spring of 2019. We contributed it to the upstream Onyx Runtime project in December. Um, the binaries have been available since 2020. Uh, this is used in production in Oracle and some other companies. I believe some of them will be talking after me about their production use cases. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that very much. Um, and our goal is basically to provide the Onyx Runtime C API in Java. So it's easy to use and it, it's sort of idiomatic. And uh, you can get all of the functionality that you'd expect. You can deploy all the models that you need to. Um, we want to try and keep feature parity with all the other APIs. Well, there's a few things that we're missing at the moment around custom memory allocation and IO binding because it's difficult to sort of express pointers and native memory operations in Java. It's not really for that. Um, but if there's something else missing or you need those features, please open an issue on GitHub and we can talk to you about it. Um, our aim really is that the Java API is a very thin layer over the C API with minimal performance impact. Um, we have an, a zero copy path through from Java into Onyx Runtime for inputs. Um, you have to do a copy on the way out, although we're looking at ways of avoiding that. Um, but fortunately, your inputs tend to be a little smaller than your outputs. So your outputs tend to be a little smaller than your inputs, so it's less of a problem doing that copy. And you have to do a copy if you're on a GPU anyway. Um, the API targets Java 8 um, and runs on all versions later than that. Um, and there's no other dependencies apart from the Onyx Runtime native, li native library, and that's packaged into it, so it's very easy to deploy. Um, so we're going to look at a quick code example. It looks very much like the Python and the other APIs, right? We're trying to be simple and, and similar to other things. So you have to make an Onyx environment. You can control like a per environment thread pool there if you need to, or the logging. Um, we didn't bother in this example. We're going to make some session options, set the number of threads that we're using, and then we load a model by reading an Onyx model in off disk, or you can read a byte array in from memory. Uh, this session exposes all the things that you would expect it to expose if you use Onyx runtime in Python. Um, you can get the metadata out. So uh, this is a CNN on MNIST. Um, so it was exported from PyTorch using the PyTorch exporter. Um, there wasn't any custom metadata or descriptions because I didn't do anything fancy while I did it. Um, you can see that the inputs, it's expecting a batch size, a single channel, and 28 by 28 pixels because this is MNIST. Um, and we get back out some batch size parameter and then the 10 digits. So when we want to feed data into it, um, as I said, there's a zero copy pathing. You have to use a byte buffer, which is a Java representation for just a stream of bytes. Um, you have to be a little careful about how you order it because for some reason Java defaults to using networking style byte buffers, which are and we wrap this in an onyx tensor. Oh sorry. Back there. Sorry. Um we're gonna wrap this in an onyx tensor. Um uh which doesn't actually do any copy, just wraps some extra metadata around it and gets the pointer out. Then we run the model by feeding in the tensor along with the name of the input that it is. We get a result object back. Um, that result object we can query to get all of the outputs out. Um, and we can see here that we have 10 values which represent the likelihood of uh, each of the digits. Uh, this is from the MNIST test set and it turns out CNNs do pretty well at that, which is why one of them has uh, is the most likely and has uh, value zero, a uh, score zero. So um, as you might expect, if you've done a lot of work with, uh, with sort of managed runtimes and interacting with native code, basically all of the work here is shuffling memory around between different heaps. Uh, in Python, that's a little easier because you can directly access pointers, but the JVM does not let you do that. So it's a bit 
a bit more tricky. And we want to be as efficient as possible so we can maximize throughput and latency. Um, uh, so to sort of minimize overheads for people. Now, this means that, that all of our Java objects have to have like a paired native object. And that native object has to be closed. Otherwise, you end up leaking native memory. Uh, and the JVM can't see that because uh, it doesn't know anything about native lab. So this is usually done with a try with resources statement, which we saw before. Um, in the future, we're going to look at adding more safety nets to ensure that everything's always cleaned up, even if it's a little bit more expensive to do that cleanup. Um, but that requires newer Java versions. Um, we do actually have paths through this for using regular arrays in Java. Um, but we recommend all users use the byte buffers because, as I said, there's a zero copy path. Um, and you can reuse that buffer again and again, so you don't have to do lots of allocations. But more generally, uh, Java's existing multidimensional arrays are a really bad abstraction for machine learning because they're not flat and there's lots of pointer chasing. So they, they tend to slow everything down if you try and use them. Um, so a little bit about where we want to go with this. I think we want to move to a more modern version of Java. Java 8 is eight years old. Um, there's a lot of new things in the platform that will make in working with native code much easier um, and uh, safer. Um, and there's a bunch of sort of language features that just will make it easier to develop with. Um, we're also interested in adding new features that are coming from Onyx Runtime. So recently, there was single op execution support added. And that would be great just to be able to sort of drive a single matrix multiply um, or some operation that you can't easily get from the JVM. And also, there seems to be some work around training. Uh, and that would be great to support as well. Training, training deep learning systems is quite difficult on the JVM at the moment. Um, and we're also going to continue to build out to match the ORTC API as new things added execution providers, methods, you know, the extra memory support. Um, contributions are welcome. This is all done upstream in Microsoft's Onyx Runtime tree. Um, and uh, we'd be happy to talk to you there. OK, so that was all about inference in models. Um, but it would be kind of nice if we could actually train models in Java and then export them as Onyx for use in the wider community. Um, you can do this. You can write the protobuf directly. right? You can, you can take the protobuf schema files and emit a Java protobuf object and then write that. But it's quite difficult to write well-formed Onyx models. There's no validation in your protobuf. You can have a perfectly valid protobuf, which is an entirely invalid Onyx model. Um, <clears throat> so we wrote a small open source library for writing Onyx models from Java. Um, we did this for exporting Onyx models from our, our Java ML library. Um, but there's actually no dependencies on it. It only really depends on protobuf and the, and the Onyx schemas. So you can use this anywhere on the JVM uh, to write out Onyx models. Uh, it's Apache 2 licensed. It lives currently in our tree um, for our library, but we, we're happy to share this with people if, if they want to use it. And it gives you sort of attribute validation, checking that your graph is correct. You can easily export Java arrays and a bunch of just sort of nice to haves on top of writing protobufs. So we've got two small examples here. Well, a code example on the right and a, a little bit of the source code on the left. So we have to define all the operators to mirror them up into Java. So this is a definition of a gem. Um, it takes two inputs and an optional input uh, and produces a single output. And then we list all of the attributes. And because we're doing this, that means that when you build the model, it can validate that the attributes are the right types, um, that they have the right names, that you didn't supply anything improper, so that it, it, you are correctly writing a valid Onyx operation. Um, <clears throat> on the right-hand side, you can see how we uh, write a simple logistic regression graph. So we start by defining some context. Then we define input and output nodes. Then we write out initializers for the weights and the biases of our multi-class logistic regression. Uh, then we do a single gem operation, taking the input, um, and that emits a gem op. Uh, and then we apply a softmax on top of the gem op. And then we assign the output of that softmax to the output placeholder node. And then we, we can build the graph. And we've generated a fully formed Onyx graph um, without any any circular behavior or invalid operator definitions. <clears throat> so we currently support a subset of Onyx op, Opset 13 and the Onyx ML operators. Uh, that was basically all the things we needed to export the set of trivial models that we had. We'd like to expand this to cover the, the full set of Onyx ops. Um, it's really easy to expand the operator enum. Um, and we might actually just look at automatically generating it from the opdef files in C++. Um, that was just a bit out of scope for our initial work. Um, we're at the moment looking at abstracting over opsets to allow users to supply different versions um, and to use their own custom ops. Um, we, we didn't do it in the initial version. We hadn't needed it, but um, it's actually pretty easy to do, and we've got a prototype up and running. Um, 
And we'd also like to integrate the provenance and metadata into these converted models. Um, we actually export Tribio's sort of very detailed model provenance object with the training data and the hyperparameters in a field in the Onyx metadata, but it's not standardized. Um, you know, we're really interested in the work Intel are doing on standardizing this so that we can emit standard metadata formats. Um, contributions are welcome to the Onyx export stuff in Tribio, um, and we're happy to talk about it if you want to.